Hi, and welcome everyone to this episode of Journeys in Transformation. We're going to talk about the promise of data analytics. Have we reached augmented intelligence? And I have to tell you, I'm really happy because we have some really super cool guests on the show. And I'll take a minute and introduce each of the three of them. First off, at least to my left, as I can see on this screen, Joanne Stonier. Joanne comes from MasterCard. She's our chief data officer there. And she's had an amazing background in data and analytics and now artificial intelligence. We'll hear a little bit more um, about her point of view in a minute. Let me introduce our second guest. Our second guest is Henna Karna. Henna is chief data officer at AXA Excel. She's joining us this morning from Boston. Henna has had a long career in data, in analytics. She started in actuarial. We'll hear a little bit about how and how much data she's touching and how she's looking to drive that forward. Our third guest today is Vikram Mahedar. Vikram's actually with Genpact and he leads our AI and our machine learning growth strategy. Um, he, Vikram came to us as part of an acquisition we did in the artificial intelligence space and previously was uh, running and leading the advanced analytics group at Deloitte. Um, Vikram spending most of his time these days pre-training our AI accelerators that we're bringing to clients and working closely with them and we'll hear a little bit more about that. So all three of you, welcome and thank you for being here. Joanne, I thought I'd actually um, ask you a quick question, really just for the, for, the, for the group here to get a sense for you. Um, you know, you described MasterCard to me and you said, look, we are a XYZ company and I wanted for you to tell us who MasterCard is, and then tell us a little bit about the amount of data you're actually touching. Sure. So uh, we are a uh, data and uh, a data company. We're a fintech company, actually. Uh, we are a payments company, uh, is what we're known for, but we're in the process of uh, transitioning into being really a, a data and technology company in the payment space primarily, but as the uh, world uh, keeps evolving, right, we are more and more a technology company. And as you think about uh, payments, uh, you know, if, and you think about digital, the digital economy, without the technology of payments, really a lot wouldn't have happened without uh, those digits that everybody uses to transact uh, in, in the economic world. So um, MasterCard has been part of that journey and we're continuing to transform as the, the form of payment continues to evolve, right? So it used to be card-based and now it's um, device-based. Um, it's in everybody's phone. It will be in cars and all sorts of devices, as well as really leveraging our network assets, that connectivity um, globally around the world. So uh, what, I've thought, uh, what I found really interesting in that is I would have introduced MasterCard as a payments company, and I heard you say that you're a data and technology company. It's fascinating. I want to come back and explore that. I caught that the first time I met you, and you said the same thing to me, and, and, and this was a few months ago when we met in New York, and it was uh, uh, remarkable. We'll come explore that. Um, Henna, when you and I were talking, um, you know, one of the things that struck me is, as you were talking about your background and how you came to be in your current position, at one point in time, you were talking about mathematics and how you saw music and mathematics. And I thought it was really, really interesting. Tell us a little bit more about that and about yourself. Sure. So I, I guess there's a lot of correlations between arts and math, music being the primary area. Um, everything as simple as rhythm and, and, and tone and setting is, is mathematically aligned. But beyond that, what I think, I think is pretty impressive around music and mathematics is how things have evolved in terms of usage of math. The usage of math is now not about theory, not about pure, the purity of it, but much more on the application side. So it's about the orchestra. It's about all the different instruments. It's all about all the different types of notes that we have and how do they bring it together. Uh, that has become more mathematically driven as opposed to before. I think there were things around, can you do very good on the cello? Can you learn the piano really well? Um, maybe in mathematics had this theory around the not theory being separate from chaos, being separate from something on the advanced analytical side. And I think today, the way that our technology has driven us, uh, we are able to connect that and actually try to create uh, a very different kind of rhythm across mathematics. That's sort of the combination I bring together here. That's, uh, that is so fun to hear. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we'll come back, obviously, to some of the challenges you're, uh, you're taking on. Before I do that, Vikram, just a quick word from you. You know, it strikes me that you work across so many industries and you've been serving our clients in a variety of artificial intelligence and, 
and, uh, and data analytics uh, areas. What's kind of the number one question you keep getting? And if you want to get that out on the table so we can get that answered later, that'd be great. I think the biggest question that we get is, is that orchestra part that Hannah talked about. How do we really create orchestra across different sets of data? And it starts with actually not just, you know, I have a violinist or I have a pianist. Uh, how do I even create more citizen pianists or more citizen musicians out there? So we should definitely. Okay, we're going to pick up all, all of those uh, threads as we go forward. So thanks each of you for sharing a little bit about yourself and the companies you serve. We're, uh, we're going to get into uh, sort of our traditional format. We'll try and do this in three different areas we want to talk about. We'll do a couple of rapid fire questions just to get to know you better. And uh, so with that, let us get started. I think the first area I want to focus one on was just data. Uh, you know, data is a big word um, and big data is a bigger word. Um, how do you even approach the word data? I mean, what types, what sources, what uses, Joanne? I mean, you've, you're handling so much data at MasterCard. Um, I had heard you talk a little bit about data and then data rights, and you've spent so much time on privacy and the compliance aspect. Tell us a little bit about how we will start thinking about data. Sure. So, you know, when you think about, when most folks think about MasterCard, they think about our transaction data, which is, you know, date, time, place, dollar amount, the merchant information. Um, and given that we use that data for large numbers of initiatives, everything from fraud, security, typical analytics, um, things along the lines of card loyalty programs, econometrics for different products. And then we also do things through data for good programs and, and different types of solutions. I have to think of that data set, obviously, every single day, right? I mean, that, that one is our largest and most structured data set. But it doesn't mean we don't have other data sets and, and other uses um, that we have to be careful of and we have to really begin to put together. And I, I love the idea of an orchestra around different sets of data, right? Because even when, you, when I have the benefit of a one very large data asset, it can make us myopic if we don't think of the other types of data that we have to add in, as well as all of the, the issues that we have with just even that data set as we begin to look at what are the other additional data elements that need to be augmented as that data morphs and changes into the future? How do we begin to think about that as the world changes, as we need additional data as, we as the world transacts, right? What do we need to collect? And then as we push forward into things like biometric data, and, and that data is going to be increasingly important as we authenticate individuals for payments and other uses. Um, and, and I think that we really have to think increasingly about the world of data quality, right? So we talk about, you know, augmenting data. We talk about the uses of data. We're going to talk about AI, I know, in, in a minute. Um, Vikram's going to have a lot to say about that. But if we don't really look at, you know, the first wave of data, we were all playing kind of honestly with it. I think we've seen in the past year what happens with fake news and fake data. I think we're all struggling with how do we make sure we have the veracity of data? How do we make sure that we understand all of the different controls around the sources of information? So um, I think uh, data, the raw data and the quality of data, sources of data, all of those controls are going to become increasingly important as we all move forward. You know, the... the, the um... The thing that struck me as you talked about it is it isn't just about data, it's about synthetic data, and it's about all of the der derivatives that are coming through and then the whole security element of that and how you think through that. And then from there on, how do you get into bias? I mean, Hannah, you're touching so much data as well. Um, give us a perspective on how you even start thinking about data and how you start structuring and organizing it in a way that that makes sense for your business. So it's a great, it's a great dilemma. It's one that... Um, you can read so much about, but not always get to the right answer. So in our space, it's um, the risk management, risk mitigation. So something as simple as understanding the changing of uh, wildfire, our climate risk, looking at the ocean changes, and looking at the, what we would call um, political risk or um, something around the lens of um, uh, geospatial differences that are happening. All of those things are data that is usually done uh, to, I think, Joanne's point, very myopically or uh, in a siloed approach. I mean, we look at weather data independent of looking at topography, independent of political uh, uh, risk or terrorism information. And in the world that we are now, the connection points are actually much more, um, they're nuanced, but they're much more critical in understanding the patterns that we need to figure out how to mitigate. So 
things like something as foundational as quality makes a huge difference. Something as, um, as critical as the way that we think of our data, types of data, uh, is, is very critical. So we see it as three different kinds of information of, uh, information flow. Something is a, uh, either seasonal, so it's got a, a rhythm that is based on, you know, in the, in the time frame in the United States of America, at least we have quite a bit of hurricanes and the, there's a hurricane season. So we're expecting information to gather to understand about that time frame. There's no seasons. There's a seasonal type of data that we could aim for. There's risk um, associated with data that is much more on the evergreen model, which means it always constantly happens. Transactional data sometimes is like that. If we think about data that's um, always coming, it's, it's uh, social feed information that's also very trans it's very 24-7. Uh, it must be always revolved and um, very cleanly managed. And then there is data that's kind of got its heights and lows, um, peaks and, 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 uh, and valleys, which is, it could be based on something around um, a hypersensitivity activity that's occurred. So we've got a, a new uh, Brexit situation that's come up or something that's gonna change the way that we look at information that was simplistically designed before, but now the hierarchies have shifted. Uh, the way that we manage our roadmaps have shifted and that is a different kind of data. So all of that, going back to Joanne's original point though, um, is bare bones is how you master it, how you manage and maintain it, how you connect those information alignments around it. Um, so those are things that we grapple on every day. Um, each one of those situations, the different kind of data elements, whether it's seasonal or whether it's evergreen or whether it's sort of um, um, spikes and valleys, those are uh, handled very differently across uh, the enterprise. Hey, Vikram, I'm going to come to you in one minute. Uh, uh, before I do that, um, both of you talked about different kinds of data. One of the things we haven't touched upon is as data comes through, what are the rights to data? Is it data that you own, data that you pass through? What do you touch? What, what do you use? What do you, what do you make sure you're careful not to use? Share, a, share with us a perspective on how to approach that governance, if you will. Joanne? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, you know, I think that uh, data ownership, right, is a, is a, is a tricky area, right? We, we have lots of different um, uh, governments and laws out there regarding data, but I think we, in some ways, data use to outpace the issue of data ownership. And I think the first thing that we can say is personal data, personal and sensitive data, most um, I'll say we as individuals own our data. And that we provided those same data elements over to lots of different organizations, right? So I would argue that the same individual may have provided their data to, to AXA, Excel, and MasterCard, right? But for different uses and different purposes. And so I would th think that both of us are different stewards of that data for different purposes. And so we think of it that way. I mean, at MasterCard, we believe that data is an organizational asset that needs to be um, taken care of and nurtured and curated. And then there are different stewards inside the organization that get to use that data for different purposes, right? Depending upon how we collected it, under what auspices and what was the primary purpose. Now, there's always the issue of secondary purpose and we use the phrase, is it congruent? Is it, you know, is it, does it align with the original purpose? And when it does, that's the easiest for individuals to understand why we're using it, right? So when we're using data for fraud, most cardholders are like, yes, please, right? Except the ones that are committing fraud, they usually don't like being caught, right? Um, but I think that, that those, these are the issues that I think the world is getting used to. Now, it's getting more complicated out there, though, right? Because we are connected ecosystems. I think Hannah made a really good point that, you know, we, as data, um, is the, the, the connection points between data are becoming more necessary as we begin to draw out the inferences and the, and the important relationships between data points. And it doesn't, and when data is not personally identifiable or in the case of AI and analytics, personally impactful, we also have to look at the use of that type of information. And I think sometimes we get very caught up in this issue of who owns the data. Now, because we use data and we then have IP rights in the then resulting analytics, that's a whole other issue that I think we are coming to, um, again, this maturity point, right, on what do we do, what do we derive from the data. And then I think there is some ownership rights in the derivation of the information we derive from what I would call the raw data that we all share that many individuals have given us that same data set over and over again. And I think we have stewardship rights in that and then ownership rights and some of the derived in insights, I would say, that we have each created as um, data stewards of that initial raw data. But that's, that's how we're looking at it at MasterCard. I'd be very curious to hear what Hannah and Vikram have to say, though. 
Hannah, you have a perspective. I've got a, I think uh, this is a fantastic tee up for Vikram in a minute, but uh, Hannah, Hannah, anything you want to add to that? I, I think you, I, you answered it really, really well. It is about intent. Uh, it's always about intent. The one thing I would say is um, there's a world about democratization of the data. And when we think around the lens of, uh, yes, our goal is to do the right thing with our data, it could be that our, and we say this, I, I would be conscious of how we say this, but our people that are, the, the, where, we're, where we're getting the data from may not always know what the benefit of that data is. And so there's mm -hmm. a, a learning curve that we have to be very transparent around is yes, the first reasons for intent were the following, but as we started mm -hmm. seeing the connection points and the analytical know-how and the trends around that, there's a better usage of that data. And that level of sort of give back the data um, in your, and if we think of it that way, how do we give data back from the data that we got? So we had information that we gained, uh, I guess, bits and bytes that we gained from our, from our businesses and, and our partners. What do we give back to them because of that? And that could be an aggregated view. It could be a, a much more holistic view. It could be a cross industry standards view. Um, which will which will give them much more viable um, reasons to give more data. I think there's a bit of a cyclical model that we can think about there. So yes, privacy is so critical and it's so important and um, security and all the things that we are thinking about yeah. from a CII standpoint, SCI standpoint, there's lots of rules and regulations around that even our, we're a regulated industry as well as, yeah. as the MasterCard is too. Um, but I find that to be, this is an opportunity for us to be highly creative in terms of what insights do we provide back outside of us just digesting the data. Oh, and I yeah. agree. I mean, one, one of the things that we are very, very sensitive to, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, you know, we have a very large initiative around what we call data for social good, right? And we also need to be mindful that, you know, we could create a world of haves and have nots if we're not careful. Data has and have nots, right? And that we need to figure out ways that we all boats rise, that we can use data and data insights, right, to solve some of this challenging issues of, of, you know, of the globe, whether that's climate, disease, right, poverty, hunger, um, all of these things are connected. But how do you do that in a way that's congruent with the purpose for which you got the data, right, and in a way that's privacy and security sensitive? And again, is the sharing of the insights, right, without the raw data that might make an individual who entrusted us with their information initially uncomfortable, right? So, I, I mean, it's a real balance. But I do think that we still have to push forward, right, to do the right thing uh, yeah. for both the individual, for the organization, but then also for the greater good, for societal good. So, I, yeah, I completely agree. Makes a lot of sense. And actually, I want to just rewind back a couple of, a couple of seconds. You know, and Vikram, look, I mean, I know that you and the team here serves a number of clients across the globe. And to Joanne's first starting point, many of our clients think of themselves as a company that used to be in a business, whether it's transportation, logistics, retail, consumer goods, and now are starting to think of themselves as a data company that happened to also serve a value proposition in consumer goods or the retail or distribution as an example. Um, and you are obviously driving a lot of the work uh, around that, but as it comes to intended use, as it comes to stewardship and ownership of data, which which belongs to the uh, to 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 um, the the users that actually um, uh, whose data it is, and then as you think about building models and IP rights to models, as you work with clients, tell us a little bit about how you think about pre-training accelerators, the notion of augmented intelligence, and and IP rights to it. Yeah, there are three three questions embedded in it, but uh, let me let me separate uh, one at a time. So I think uh, first of all, it's fascinating to hear. Uh, but, you know, how both of you, Joanne and, and Hannah, how you see your companies, very, very interesting. Um, the, the, when it comes to uh, data ownership and particularly around creating models, you know, we get this question asked all the time that so if you're using my data, that means who owns the models? Do you own the model? Do I own the model or the data that you're blending in? For example, if I'm taking in payments data with weather data, which company owns the, the model? Weather company or the, or the uh, payments company? And oh, by the way, more importantly, uh, when it comes to intent, right? Um, uh, the intent can be just simply predicting uh, an outcome for the end consumer. Uh, but then also the intent can be uh, something that can benefit both of these data companies who own the different data sets. So what we are seeing out there is actually abstracting uh, the models that can be pre-trained 
to analyze weather data as well as payments data, for example, separately. But then bringing them together around a specific intent, that's what we pre-train models around. And those pre-trained models can be abstracted enough so that the personal information can be separated from it and the models can be made available to potentially all the data providers in the ecosystem, if you may. And actually what, what we are seeing is in terms of data stewardship, uh, some, of the, some of the chief data officers and CIOs are now coming up with this concept of data hub where they're making the data or uh, you know, some uh, sample data or synthetic data available in a hub format where a startup or a company like Genpack can go in, use that data, use our pre-trained accelerators to get you that insight and actually not only that, but think about it from action standpoint. Because in many cases, what is, what is happening is that companies are deriving insights from those pre-trained accelerators or models that are out there, but putting it to action, that's where rubber meet the, meets the road. And that is being not thought through. And it has actually a significant amount of change management involved as well. So the, from the augmented intelligence, which is the third piece that Sanjay used, the way we are thinking about it is, we are saying, okay, look, data is not gonna, even if you figure out the entire data puzzle, it's not gonna be sufficient in itself. The second piece that you need to really figure out is how you're gonna derive insights from it. But the third piece is also how you're gonna put it into action. And the action part is yeah. where you draw the sort of continuum between machine intelligence and human intelligence. And what we're really trying to do with machine learning and AI is move that fulcrum more and more towards human intelligence where human intelligence is being used for uh, specific characteristics like bringing in empathy or context uh, to a particular situation uh, versus you know, sitting and becoming you know, analysts and analyzing and cleaning that data all day long. That's how sort of you know, what we are seeing out there. Uh, so in the Vikram, feedback from Hannah and, and Joanne here. Well, I was just going to say it's fantastic, right? Because I think you've answered the question on separating the data layer from the model itself and making them two different entities and then being able to apply different ownership and, and, and prescription and subscription rights to it, which I think is right. But it was uh, interesting that, you know, maybe 10 or 12, 15 minutes into the conversation on data for the first time, we got into the human in the loop part of the discussion and you brought it up in the context of augmenting intelligence. But I'd love to hear uh, Hannah and Joanne from your perspectives, I mean, on Vikram's last point about the human in the loop around the AI and the analytics use cases, what's your perspective? I can go first, I guess. Uh, um, it is very much around the balance between what the AI is trained on and then what we need it to do. So the human in the loop starts from the ground up. Uh, an AI engine is an algorithm written by human beings. Um, it is written in a way with, with context that those individuals that are writing it understand. Uh, and then we're asking it to do things in a rapid fashion, in a much more um, holistic in some cases, but definitely in a rapid fashion, right? There's a real speed to value when it comes to algorithms. And um, certainly going back to the world of mathematics, it's, it's, um, it's a catch-22. The great thing about math is that there are multiple ways to get to solutions that, that you can take a proof and you can find so many different approaches to get to that answer. In AI, the art behind that science is just that. How do you find uh, algorithms that can be interconnected in such a way that you're getting uh, less bias, less human bias, and more intellectual connection points that were not originally humanly possible? Um, that is very much the art and science combination. I think you touched on everything for sure in the sense that there is a bit about context generation, the, the intuitiveness that we human beings are driven by. There's all, intuition is, all, is, all, is also just um, hypothetical thinking, right? We have, we have intuition because we've seen so many other things that give us that intuition. So that is data in itself. How does the algorithm sort of replicate that intuition-based thinking, which it may not be quantitative, may be very qualitative mm -hmm. in, some, in some nature, uh, and then, of course, there's that creativity lens, right? So I understand today with 100,000 data points, you can give me a million more, I might understand it a lot better, but I might miss a complete shift in the market, right? A complete shift in the nuances of the things that are coming through. So that may not be, um, it might be out of sight, out of mind, and the algorithm may actually exacerbate the out of sight, out of mind thinking around it. So how do we balance all those factors? And I, I, it's a great problem. It's, a, it's, it's where our world is headed to solve, I guess. 
It is. Over it to is. You, Joanne. In, in fact, you know, one more piece. If I were to, if I were to sort of, you know, real quick uh, chime in there, which is the the uh, whole intelligence around domain. Uh, you know, even though uh, there may be multiple ways AI can lead us to a particular answer or pattern identification, but okay. unless you really sort of bring in the domain expertise to help interpret what that means, uh, you know, very quickly the value of it can vanish. So we, we put a lot of emphasis on domain as well. So Vikram, what you're really saying yeah, is that, oh, sorry, sorry. I was yeah. going to say, Vikram, what you're really saying is that you can get any analytics out of data as long as you torture the data long enough to be able to get that answer out. <laughs> you need the human in the loop to do that. Joanne, you were saying? No, no, I'm, I'm listening and I'm, and I'm agreeing. I mean, I think, I think, you know, but back to your question, you know, Sanjay, that, you know, so where, 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 how do you have humans intervene in this, right? And what's our responsibility in all of this? I think it's, you know, it's early days, right? Let's face it, it's early days. And I think our intervention is super important as we begin to try to figure this out because look, the speed is part of the deal and the volume of information that can be, that can be processed. But then hopefully there's going to be all of these insights as well that we can't spot because of the speed of processing as well as the pen is trying, I think, very elegantly saying, you know, if you structure your AI well in the mathematical equation of it, it's going to start yielding a different level of insight than we even understand, right? However, it's also going to, even no matter our best intentions on eliminating all the different kinds of biases from automation bias and confirmation bias and coverage bias, right, and discriminatory bias. The challenge is if you're not careful on the input and whether that's the algorithmic input or the training data bias, right? The algorithm is gonna learn what our biases have been all along, right? And so they're gonna start popping up in the data. And so somebody's gotta be reviewing that, right? Because we are society, societies, right? And even then, if we don't have enough data, that the bias is gonna show that the data is, has a paucity, and so then we're gonna have that problem. So I think all of that review has to happen now while we're in early days and we have the opportunity to intervene. I think if we don't intervene now to understand what we're missing, I think that's gonna be the real challenge. And, and my, my fear is always that we just don't have enough time to do all of that work, right? Um, and we don't have enough talent and we don't have enough people. Um, and so these are, these are some of the challenges I think that we face, even as we keep moving ahead, right? How do we do this fast enough? So um, I don't know if any of you guys have enough, uh, have enough answers for that for me, but, uh, but, but I think it's, this is the time when the human intervention is super important. So it's, I, I love the fact that this conversation started in data and the bits and bytes of uh, all of that it uh, comprises, but it's quickly moved into a much broader discussion about people and the role we play around intervention, around intended use, around direction, and around uh, making sure that we put this to good use. Um, you know, some of this now comes to people. And one of the key uh, positions in any company that we've got to get right is the role of the chief data officer. And, and, and it strikes me that you guys are great representatives of that community. Joanne, um, what does a great, jo uh, a great chief data officer make? H how do you spot one? What, what's, you know, g g give us a sense for what are the two or three things we should be looking for in that role? Oh. <laughs> um. I don't know. I hope maybe uh, you, you can tell me, but um, I think there's a little bit of duality in what makes a, a, chief, uh, a great uh, chief data officer, because I think there's a lot of yin and yang that goes into the job. I think you have to have, <clears throat> on the one hand, you have to be very humble and have a lot of humility, um, because you need to be willing to learn something new every day. And then on the other hand, you have to be inspiring because you've got to lead people into a greenfield place where there's no, not necessarily a rule book for how to do this because I think data is contextual in every organization, right? So there are some organizations that are using this for operational optimization, and then there's others that are using the chief data officer to help figure out new products and solutions, and then others that are a combination they're in. I think that you need to have creativity, right? But you also need to be practical and have an ability to make it, you know, not only about the future, but also about the now. So there's a little bit about now and later in the job. So again, there's a duality. And then I think uh, the, the chief data officer has to be able to see the pig, big picture, right, about wh where this is going for the organization and be a great strategist. 
but also be able to be detail oriented and willing to go all the way down into the, the most detailed part of the, the process, uh, whether that's an algorithm, a, an analytic, a, a piece of data, a data string, right? Um, you know, we just did an analysis of our transaction data string, 1800 variables, right? And I was sitting there with my team going through all of them, right? So there's an incredible duality, I think, to being a good chief data officer. And then you've got the problem of being a bilingual, right? You've got to speak tech and you've got to speak business if you're going to do this job well. So um, the word I use is a lot of duality. Um, so um, I don't I know if that. that's the best thing, but that's, that's what I've got for you for today. <laughs> I, love, I love the words. I love, I love uh, bilingual. I love duality. I think they're exactly right. Uh, you know, Hannah, uh, I think your video was off for a second or so, but thanks. Uh, um, it, yeah, it sounds like you're back. Listen, um, I want to go back to the music example, and if if the if the musical instruments are the different data sources, and I think I'm stretching this a little bit, and if the if, if the people that are playing that are the different algorithms that you're using, what what is a great orchestra uh, or, uh, orchestra conductor make? Like, what what are the qualities you see there? So uh, I think the most important thing there is to know each instrument. What is the play of an instrument with another instrument? How do you connect those two things together? So when I have a flute on its own, it's quite beautiful. I put it next to a sitar, it's a very different type of music. And that connection point creates different type of stories. And part of what I think Joanne is referring to when it comes to duality and bilinguality is it is that um, there was the, you know, we, have, we have music today that I didn't know existed 25, 30 years ago. I sat in a, in a, uh, con uh, concert just two, three weeks ago with um, Anuksha Sh uh, Shankar, who is our Ravi Shankar's daughter. She was here with a double player, with a violinist, a uh, cello player, a pianist, uh, of course, a flute player, and a, a few other Indian drums. But the combination of those things I had never heard before. I mean, I couldn't have imagined them. That's where data brings us today. So I think, in terms of an orchestra uh, or a conductor, You'd have to really know the strengths of every instrument on their own, but of course, bringing it together with something else. And things that are not viable now that you didn't know, you'd have to be able to go, be willing to test it out. Um, there's a bit of experimentation that data has to go through. Uh, it is not a place that is cookie cutter anymore. Perhaps there was a situation where it was before, but now the story about data and analytics are things that are trying to open up green space, trying to open up new landscapes. That's the same thing with new orchestras. Um, or the world becomes very uh, global, for lack of a better word. You have instruments that are bleeding to every, every facet. It's not just jazz anymore. It's not just blues anymore. It's not just classical anymore. It's all hyper-connected. And that's, I guess, the answer to your question, hopefully. Oh, it does. And it's, uh, it's beautiful. What a great answer. So, um, Vikram, I'll turn to you. Why don't you add uh, to that? Yeah, so see, I mean, you, you use the word hyperconnected, and it's, uh, it's very interesting. You know, recently I spent time with uh, a chief supply chain officer and a CIO, and what we were talking about was a hyperconnected supply chain. And, you know, how do you really sort of predict the demand, manufacture just enough right place, and deliver it right place at the right time? And this is not a new problem set. You know, we've been trying to solve this problem set since the advent of OR, Operations Research. Right, which uses all kinds of math that you talked about. However, now with the advent of uh, new data sets, uh, when I say advent of new data sets, it's also discovery, but some of the new data sets that we are capturing at the front end, whether it is demand signal or, or uh, you know, understanding how weather plays into your transportation uh, schedule, et cetera, uh, it basically creates a, a whole new role of a supply planner which is, which is basically an orchestrator role, if you may, uh, to create this hyper-connected supply chain. So, so what we see is it's also creating this whole new set of jobs uh, out there. You know, there's, there's a whole notion out there that, oh, you know, is AI going to replace human beings and, and is it going to create uh, sort of, you know, a uh, lot of jobless people? In my view, at least in the last more than a decade that I've been doing work in AI, uh, it is creating more new jobs and more engaging jobs for human beings where they can add a lot more value in terms of creating the hyper-connected uh, systems, if you may. Can I add it really quickly? One of the risks that we do have, I totally agree with you, Vikram, there is no delay. Uh, we should not be worried about 
loss of job. It should be actually, we should be excited the fact that our job is going to be more meaningful. Um, that said, I think education has not caught up yet. If you think about yeah. the degrees of, com of, of, of universities across the globe, uh, there are smaller degrees starting to come up that are a bit more around business analytics, a bit more around um, MIT, of course, started a yeah. new MBA on business analytics. We had uh, master's in robotics now coming up. We have some AI programs, a lot of certifications. Um, but the intent of all of those programs are not as deep as perhaps we need it to be in, the, in a matter of, you know, five years, not 25 years, in five years. I think there's a bit of a hang up we have to do on that piece. No, I, I agree. And, but, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Joanne. No, no, I, I think I think the talent issue is something that we, we all need to start thinking about. And we need to start thinking about it more broadly, right? I think we can start talking about training of data scientists as one very significant thing, but I think we've got to talk about all the other jobs that are being impacted, right? AI is going to require a whole different kind of framework around the law, right? Just think about, you know, how product liability is going to shift, right? Cyber is going to shift, right? I mean, so there are adjacencies, right, in technology that are going to shift as cybercrime is augmented by artificial intelligence, right? We need to be thinking about that. We need to be thinking about all of how the value chain changes, right? And we, we're not really talking about that so that um, all of the basic line skills begin to get adjusted for what artificial intelligence is going to change in society. I mean, it's not going to put us all out of jobs, you know, in, in way it's going to change and alter what's happening in society. And instead, we talk about very specific programs and MIT is a great example. They're beginning to start working with, I think, Georgetown in their law school, but it's like we need to start going down the, going down the, the value chain to say, okay, what are all the different shifts, right, that need to be looked at so that all of the different skill sets begin to be um, embraced because I think otherwise people are afraid of what it means because there's some kind of future where everybody's, I don't know, sitting on a couch somewhere with a robot next to them, which is not really real at all. So, well, well, sure. You know, I thought, I thought I'd ask a very simple question, but really what's coming at me is amazing. Um, I think the point about duality and the and, and then being able to uh, be a bilingual, both of the tech depth, but also the business context. I think the notion, uh, what an amazing notion of kind of new music forms and orchestras and, 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 and entourage of different instruments that hadn't previously come together and the music it creates and the opportunities it uh, delivers. And I think Vikram, to your point, you know, the changing narrative and the role of the chief data officer and setting the strategy and the vision and actually changing the narrative, not only around skill sets and, and cross skilling, but around productive and, and positive uses of AI in a way that actually benefits all of us. Uh, I don't think I could have asked for more. I do want to um, spend a few minutes before we close this show. That, by the way, we could, we, could, we could probably spend another hour on this and still not get done. It's uh, amazing to have such a powerful um, group of uh, leaders here. Um, but I, I want our audience to get a little bit of sense and feel for you individually before we shut down. And so I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions. And what that means is, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a question. Uh, maybe I'll go with you, Joanne, first, and then Vikram, and then Hannah, so we'll just follow that order. There'll be three questions and, and just one sentence, short answers, just so we get a sense for you. Um, first one, um, and this is gonna be a good one. So what's most important? Is it data or is it the algorithm? Joanne. <laughs> Oh man, um, I'm not sure you can really choose because both are important, but I think I'm going to lean on the data right now because uh, I think that, um, you know, because of the issues we've spoken about, right, I think that uh, right now we're at a tipping point on quality and I think of veracity. I'm, I'm really um, at a place where I'm looking at truthfulness of data and truthfulness of data sources that right now I think we have to really look at that. Um, I think algorithms, I think we can, we can adjust the algorithms. I think we have the science to do that. We have the science to really understand what we're doing with them. But I think if we don't have the right data, the training data, um, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on data right now. But that's my okay. answer, my rapid answer. Okay, so you've gone with data. Vikram? Just to be contrary, you know, I'll, I'll choose algorithm. Uh, because okay. I feel that, I feel that uh, you know, algorithms are... Uh, can also generate data. Nowadays, we are generating a lot of synthetic data just using <laughs> okay. algorithms. Uh, so, you know, I would I would go with algorithms. Okay. okay. And Hannah, you? I would have done algorithms also, partly because uh, we have a world where we're fixing data has always been there. I don't think big data is a new thing, 
Um, I, I would say in the early 90s, I was doing AI work with, with some, what we call genetic algorithms, which is a different phase of, or a different form of AI, or deep learning, deep neural nets. But what has happened is the information, the data that, that I think, Joanne, you talk about quite a bit around, on the, on the quality of it has become hypersensitive. We have to think about now all those holes, the gates, the, the endpoints that we don't, we didn't know about much more, but the algorithms help us understand that a bit more. So we actually get to know more about our data because of our algorithm and going back to Rickson's point, get more of our data that we actually need relative to the algorithm themselves. So there's a bit of a cyclical effect there. Um, and we've lost your hand, but <laughs> um, I'm back, I'm I think back. the algorithms really give us to give us a fine tuning of where we need to get more. And um, it gives us a mall map, for lack of a better uh, I love the chicken and egg kind of uh, nature of the answers. <laughs> Uh, and the description there. Okay, let me switch gears. I'll ask you another question. Um, give us an example of a really good cognitive application you've seen either in your personal or in your professional life. Uh, Joanne, we'll start with you. No, start with Hannah on this one. Okay. I'm, I want to think the light in my gonna... office just went out. That's where I went. <laughs> okay, oh, Hannah, we'll start with you. A cognitive application. Yeah, something that uses data to deliver, uh, uses AI to deliver something that is beneficial either for your work environment or in your personal life. Oh, I, I think there is a huge aspect in health, to be honest with you. Um, if you that where maybe my head goes is how much better can the world be if our cognitive applications are fine tuned in such a way that we can get more information better. So. Uh, so many so many uh, diseases and so much data around it is, are, are disparate and they're in smaller entities all across the globe. And these cognitive computing tools, these sort of uh, environments or platforms that are generating all those connection points are making some of the most bespoke rare diseases more evident and more obvious for all human beings. And that's, that's where you can get foundational benefits too. I mean, investing in, in grants that are doing those things are much more likely now because I, we know more. We know more. Vikram, how about you? Yeah, you know, actually, similar application came to my mind of pharmacovigilance, particularly where you know we are identifying adverse effects of drugs out there through wide variety of data streams, right from treat to you know physician complaints that come through, and analyzing those in a predictive manner uh, to pretty much save lives. Uh, and such a powerful and meaningful impact of of uh, a cognitive application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Joanne. Go ahead. No, you know, I, I agree. I, I was trying to think of one, um, and I, I don't have one, but I'm, I'm along the same lines on um, the, the, the it's, it's, it's related to health, but it's uh, food production, right, and climate change. And just I think that we're, we're at a real interesting tipping point where we're going to be able to do some really interesting things around uh, um, you know, getting away from some of the harmful farming um, practices that we've embraced and, and some really uh, cool things around uh, food to, to help with the world hunger problem. So um, I think that we're on, at a tipping point um, and it's related to health. Uh, I think that uh, AI is going to do some really good things in the next five years that we're going to be, that are going to be really good for the globe. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to ask one last question and I'll let you guys go. Look, there's this whole narrative around AI, and I think you referred to it a few, few times now in the back of data and you know, the good and the bad of it. Um, there's a role, at least in my mind, there's a real need to actually change the narrative, particularly around jobs in the future of work. Any advice you would have as chief data officers on that? Uh, you know, if you could influence public policy, if you could have a perspective on, on uh, humanity, what would that be? Keep an eye on the humanity. Uh, I think we are not trying to solve data problems. We're not trying to solve, you know, how does industry grow for the sake of just growth. Uh, every industry exists for a reason of some type of giving back. Uh, and I would say that if we can, as CDOs, as chief data officers, keep that as the prize, then we will do right by our data, but we also give it, we'll also do right by the entire cyclical process that we've talked about recently on this conversation. I don't know if, um, Everyone here has the sort of the, the responsibility as industry leaders on this call, at least, to to go and, and we, we own that, I guess, responsibility to figure out what do we do with our data, so that we can make the world better, so we can make the world safer. Um, cyber risk being one example, and there's a deep deep uh, the deep web is not hacked enough. I mean, there's a lot of information to to, to learn how to mitigate human trafficking. There's so many things that we can do, 
if we could just get our, our armies enforced and do it that way. I think we spend a lot of time doing other things, but um, that's what I would suggest. All, all eyes on the prize, we could make the world a better place. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> if I'm speaking to regulators, I think I, I want them to be, I want them to remember that not all AI is individually impactful. I think that, you know, some AI is for the benefit of society. Um, I think that sometimes uh, that so much of the regulation is focused on bias and, and harm. Um, I agree with Hannah that I think ethical companies um, are looking at the broader impact and want to move AI and, and data generally forward for social good. And I think, you know, we have a, we, we have a really strong ethic here at MasterCard around um, being decent, right? And decency being at the core and the motivation of everything that we do. And I think when it comes to all of our data practices, um, one of the things that we really embrace is that when our, our, our business practices generally, whether it's data um, practices or any of our practices impact individuals, that we have to keep individuals at the center of our thoughts. And I think, I think that that's really true in this area. And our what's are going to impact individuals. We need to keep that really at the center of all of our governance practices and really um, at, at, at the center of what we're doing. And I think that that's important for, for all companies that are leaning in. And it's important to kind of have those conversations with your connected ecosystem partners as well. So I would, I would, I would echo a little bit of what Hannah is saying. Okay, Vikram. I would, I would just add to it. I would say that, you know, uh, regulators should really sort of invest a lot in, in education of, of uh, uh, you know, data around data as well as, in, uh, as, well as algorithms, because I believe that uh, most of the consumers are not aware of what happens to their data. It's, it's a black box. So everybody's afraid that if I give away my data, what happens, or they just give it away and they don't know what happens, what comes out of it. But as a user, especially given, given that I live in the AI world, sometimes I purposefully feed data to certain algorithms, be it you know, conversational interfaces or what have you, because I know that in the future, I'm gonna get better output. So I think investing in education of what that data life cycle looks like, also what these algorithms really are. You know, to Joanne's point, they're not, many of them are for social good, but what do they do? What's the output? I think uh, all that needs to be in place. There has to be a good educational framework. Okay, folks, what an inspiring sort of endpoint to a fascinating discussion, the notion of a higher level purpose to a chief data officer's role, grounding it in humanity, focusing on governance, and really taking it up to the next level. Thank you to all of you uh, for participating. Thank you for our audience for tuning in. Uh, this will also be available on social media, so you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. And if you do, we'll get this panel involved in getting some answers back to you. Thank you for joining. Good day.